So we're finishing up from where we were last week. Last week we looked at Revelation chapter 17, the whole mystery Babylon thing. And we were able to get through a lot of information, um, quite a great deal. Uh, first off, uh, Ben is texting us saying that he made it down safely. So Ben Good. was with us last week. Uh, just arrived back in Brazil where he's at his writer's retreat for the uh, next few months. And so he says, uh, made it down safely. Glad to see and hear you all. Lord bless us for this time in your word. So Amen. that's great to know Ben made it safely to Brazil. And uh, Vaughn has uh, departed. Uh, for Southeast Asia. He's on his way to Ho Chi Minh City to do uh, a, a business deal uh, in Vietnam. So let's pray for Vaughn who's traveling. I think he's flying out of uh, LAX in Los Angeles. And he said he'll be arriving in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam on Sunday morning. So that's a long flight. So 16, 18, let's, uh, okay. let's remember our, our brother Vaughn in prayer as he, he makes uh, travels. Uh, and so he won't be able this, but Ben thankfully is joining us via the internet, and so let's just recap real quickly what we looked at last week. We were able to uh, take a look at the uh, Revelation chapter 17, and when we looked at that, we were able to see that Mystery Babylon is uh, a city, uh, it's a false religious system, it's a goddess based system of worship. And it's also, uh, you know, a, a move in society and, and has dated back from as far away as ancient Babylon of Nimrod and Semiramis and reiterated itself again through the goddess worship system as a religious system that we see that was involved in the pagan worship of ancient Israel. We're going to look at some of the verses tonight. Um, so when we hear the word Babylon in the Bible, we should remember that it's talking about a real place, a real city, ancient Babylon, where Nimrod established the first world empire, and his wife, Semiramis, created, with the inspiration of Satan, that which was begun, where? In the Garden of Eden, back in Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Satan, in the form of a serpent, went to Eve, separated her out from her husband, Adam, and made a, a proposition to her that she found was too good to be true. Mm -hmm. That if she rebelled against her husband and against God by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she mm -hmm. would obtain a cultic, or that is to say, hidden, which is what the word cult really means, mm -hmm. hidden knowledge, a cultic knowledge, which would be able to cause her to evolve. There's where the theory of evolution that was popularized by Darwin also started in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. She would be able to evolve into goddesshood. And wow, that would be a great deal. You know, no longer does she have to listen to the authority of God or the authority of God through her husband. She gets to be in charge. And so she thought that was a good deal, but part and parcel of the deal that she struck with Satan was that she had to get her husband to go along with the program. And we find out in the New Testament, tragically, that Adam was not deceived by the serpent in the garden. There wasn't any interaction between them whatsoever. However, it was the inspiration or the encouragement or the cajoling or the, if you want to say nagging, of his wife that got him to go along with it so that he could have peace in the house. He went along with it and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as well. And because he was the guy that God put in charge, not only of the family of Adam and Eve, but of the family of the whole human race, and he was the governor or the caretaker for the entire planet Earth, once he rebelled and fell, his fall was imputed to everything else alive. And so today, we see, when we look at the New Testament, we see repeated references to what? To Adam's sin. But you never see reference to Eve's sin. But she sinned first, and she got her husband to go along with this. That doesn't seem fair. But it is fair when you realize that Adam was the guy that God created and selected for the position of headship and leadership. And when you're in leadership, you go down with the ship. Now, we look at, we look at sports as, as, as a popular or common uh, you know, motif. Uh, NFL, every day I'm going to look at on TV, somebody's getting fired from the NFL. The head coach, not the water boy, not the equipment manager, but the head coach. Why? Because we hired you and pay you the big bucks to make the whole team run. 
If the team isn't running well, you're out. And so we see the same thing, college football, pro football, sports teams. You see that in corporations. You know, if a corporation isn't doing as well as it should be, the CEO is usually the guy that gets the ax. And then they bring in a new CEO and see if we can get a new game plan. So Adam was the CEO of the human race and the planet Earth. And when he listened to his wife, he tried to say, well, but she, you know, the woman that you gave to be with me, she convinced me to do it, and I did eat. And God says, what is this that you've done? Not because he didn't know what he had done, but because he was rhetorically giving her and Adam a teaching moment. And that's where the interaction between Eve and God himself, interesting, Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says, you know, because you've done this, um, your desire will be towards your husband. That is, in the original Hebrew, your desire is going to be to dominate your husband. And genetically, all the daughters of Eve inherit that same sort of gene for rebelliousness and for the desire to dominate the male authority that God has placed in their lives. And that's what we see when Adam and Eve was created. You know, she was created to be a helpmeet for Adam, and he was the head of the family. Uh, but she decided that she didn't want to go along with that program, and so Satan gave her another program to go, to go along with, where she could be in charge. And, you know, uh, Adam would have to go along with it, which he did. And so we see that same sort of uh, motif being repeated time and time again throughout history from the fall that began way, way back in the Garden of Eden, which, you know, we kind of look at um, on our time chart here. We can see that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, according to the Bible. And we see that the fall is here in the Garden of Eden. This is our 7,000-year-long time chart where the final thousand years of which which hasn't begun yet, but which may be beginning soon because of the return of Christ. So follow the bouncing red ball here, and we see that in the garden, innocence is lost, when Eve listens to and agrees with the gambit of the serpent, obtains occultic knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, gets her husband to go along with it. As a result, God comes down, judges the woman by saying, your desire will be towards your husband, but he's going to rule over you. And judgment upon Adam, everything in the universe is going to die. And when it does, you will be responsible. It's a heavy burden for uh, Adam to, uh, to have to bear. And so the sons of Adam, men, us, you know, have inherited that, that same burden. But the good news is that God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, he was going to raise up the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent who had set up this whole entry by deceiving and seducing Eve into the deception and into the occultic uh, goddesshood attempt that she was not even enough to believe would be a good thing. And that is the first prophecy of a Messiah. And we know that women don't have seed. The Hebrew word there in Genesis chapter 3 is zera, which is the same word that's used for sperm. Um, women don't have reproductive uh, cells such as men, sperm cells, they have egg cells. But what we find out when we look at that language being applied is that God was supernaturally and prophetically telling us that the God-man that would be born of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent and redeem back the human race, which now is lost. Why? Because we're all sons of Adam. Because Adam, our biogenetic and metaphysical forefather, fell Everything has to die, including us and all of our children. But God is saying, we're going to raise up the God-man who's going to undo the curse. He's going to reverse the curse of Adam. So he is considered and called by Paul in the New Testament the second man, as opposed to the first man, Adam. He's called the last Adam, as opposed, again, to the first man, Adam. And so we find out that he must be born of a virgin because if a man was involved in the sexual reproductive act, the fallen sin nature apparently travels through, you know, the Y chromosome, which is carried only by the male, into the newborn child. And so God cuts out the Y chromosome of Adam and supernaturally impregnates a virgin. Many uh, centuries later, you know, uh, we find out that Jesus is actually born 
4,000 years after the fall in the Garden of Eden as a result of Mary being supernaturally impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, Christmas is coming up. Even though Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, we see that, you know, these little manger scenes and like that, though we see fewer of them as time goes by. You know, that's what they're talking about. You know, a virgin shall conceive and give birth, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. He shall deliver his people from their sins. And that's the whole idea of the birth of Jesus. So that's good news. The bad news was that as a result, Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. And as a result of that, the entire uh, mystery Babylon system begins to take place. Now, for probably you know, many generations, there were God-fearing people on the earth who were the, the children of Adam and Eve, the, the children of men. But, just like we found out with the story of Cain and Abel, you know, the first two kids that Adam and Eve conceived together, one of them was a good guy and one of them was a bad guy. One of them made a sacrifice to God that was pleasing and acceptable to God. The other made a sacrifice to God begrudgingly. And God didn't find it worthy or acceptable. And as a result, he hated God and he hated his brother. And so he went off and killed his brother. And, you know, he got kicked out of Adam's household. And as a result of that, you had the first corporate rebellion against the authority of God. And his children, undoubtedly, were raised up and continued on. God could have struck him dead, and he mercifully put a mark on him so that the wild beast wouldn't kill him and that he could have a chance to continue to live on. And as a result, we have, you know, good people in terms of faith in God or belief in the God of the Bible versus people that reject the God of the Bible. All of us are born in sin. All of the sons of Adam, the children of men, are born in sin, dead and trespassing in sin, we find out in the New Testament. But some choose to follow after God and pursue the forgiveness that's being made available through God through the birth of a virgin-born God man. And others choose to reject. And that is the terrible burden of free will. The terrible burden of free will is that some people will choose rightly, but most people will choose wrongly. I remember, you know, when I was a kid and you know in high school, even college, it was a group called Petra, it was like this contemporary Christian music group, and they, they made a number of, of songs that were popular in Christian radio at the time, but they had one song that was very different than the rest, because it was a lot of those, you know, kind of heavy guitar, almost like it's almost a rock motif, but they had an acoustic guitar song, and I remember when I heard it for the first time, it was like hauntingly beautiful, and the lyric of the opening, you know, passage of that song, you know, it, it kind of it stuck with me, it resonated with me, I and mean, to this day it brings to my mind when I think, you know, and the song was called The Road to Zion. And I remember the very first line in the song says, uh, There is a way that leads to life. The few that find it never die. And that was taken from an Old Testament passage that talks about the broad way that leads to destruction versus the narrow way that leads to life. And they made this whole song around it. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's from uh, Zechariah or whatever. I forget which Old Testament prophet it was. But even you know, as a youth, I remember thinking how tragic it is that that, that song is, is speaking a truth that the Bible contains from the Old Testament through the New, that you know, that there is a way that leads to life. And they say, the few that find it never know. Why is it just a few? And, I, you know, a child like mine, I hated that idea once I learned that there was a place called hell. I used to pray that everybody in the whole world would go to heaven, which was this kind of challenge, you know. It was the heart of God, you know, like, you know, Jesus wants everybody to be saved, and so did I. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pray that everybody goes to heaven. Now, that can't happen, because in my child's naivete, I thought if I pray hard enough, everybody in the whole world, including Hitler and all the bad people, could go to heaven. But no, because God has given us what? The gift and the burden of free will, some people are going to choose to accept the forgiveness that God provides to us in the person of Jesus Christ or reject it. And the Bible clearly points out that most people reject it. Why? Because the way of the flesh is easier. It's easier to give in to your fleshly temptations, right? And go along your own way. I want to do my own thing. I don't want some guy in the sky telling me who I can hang out with, telling me what I can do, telling me when I can have sex, telling me when I can't, telling me who I can marry or how many times I can be married. 
You know, I don't want somebody running my life. I want to be the head of my own life. And so because of that, we're given the freedom of choice to reject Jesus Christ or to accept him. And we find out, even in the Old Testament, you know, it says, you know, that there, there is a way that leads to life. And that way that leads to life is Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament. You know, there were prophecies about the Messiah coming and having to die to redeem back that which was lost by the original Adam. But the few that find it never die, which means that the vast majority of the children of men, of the sons of Adam, are wandering around in the darkness. And it's sad because everybody, at the end of the day, everybody wants eternal life. They may not style it as such. People that are looking for happiness, people are looking for peace, people are looking for the way that leads to life. But because they have been so conditioned, by whom? By the God of this world. When Adam listened to Eve, bowed the knee to her will, and rejected the authority of God, he cast the entire human race into sin and darkness and ignorance. And as a result, now people are blindly groping for that which was lost, the way that leads to life. The few that find it never die. The vast majority don't find it. That's why we're here. That's what the job of the church is. Not to go out with guns and knives and bombs and blow things up, and like blow up abortion clinics or go to war with the Muslims to take back you know, Jerusalem for the Christians or, you know, things of that nature. No, our job is to go out into the highways and the byways and find those law-seeking people who are seeking the way that leads to life but can't find it. Our job is to go seek those people and when we find them, what does that verse in Matthew 24 say? It says, compel them to come in to the kingdom of God that God's house might be full. Remember he uses that parable to say there was a great king and he threw a wedding feast for his son and very few people showed up and he was upset. He said, all right, send out the servants again. Go into the highways and the byways. Go to the rich and the poor. The good and the bad are welcome in and compel them to come in that my house may be full. And that's exactly what the mission of the church is and we get so confused because Satan has done a brilliant job of distracting the church, or people who call themselves part of the church, by doing what? Getting us involved in building plans, getting us involved in cable television, satellite television. Oh, we need to get our church show in a hundred thousand different, you know, uh, houses throughout, you know, Southeast Asia, North America, South America. So we need a lot of money so we can give it to TVN and make Jan and Paul Crouch and the other, you know, people that own Christian television satellites rich. And so you end up spending all your time in the church raising money, generating money to do things like buy stuff, like build a nursery or build an addition to the church so you can have a school or so that you can build out a kitchen so you can have Starbucks right there in the church and all this. Nothing wrong with, with, with having a school. There's nothing wrong with having coffee. There's nothing wrong with daycare. But that's not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to do what Jesus did, which was what? To seek and save that which was lost. All of those children of men that are wandering around in the dark are seeking the way that leads to life. But few of them will find it. Our job is to go out, find those people, and help them find the way that leads to life. And to the extent that we do that, we have riches and rewards in heaven, and more importantly, we have the approval and the blessings of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's sitting there saying, uh, there's my guy Steve doing my, doing my work. There's Genevieve at the laundry mat, passing out those tracks. You know, even though most of the people, and, 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 and we know that from the other, most of the people are going to reject you. But every now and then, somebody's going to take it, and they're going to go home and read it, and they're going to get saved. And they're going to be in heaven after the rapture. You're going to run into them, and you're going to find out for the very first time that person you weren't even thinking about that you gave that track to. And it was like, oh, it's the last track of the day. Everybody told me to take a hike. Let me just, let me just do it. Boom. And the last time you did it, it worked. You didn't know it because they didn't get saved until, you know, much later, and you never saw them again. But 
you'll see them when we get to the kingdom of heaven. So that's the encouragement, that's the motivation for every one of us. Keep in mind the mission of the church. We are soldiers behind enemy lines, and we are in the final days of the church. Times are getting worse. Evil is on the upspread. The mystery Babylon system is in full effect. You see, now is probably the worst time in the history of man to be a male. You know, <laughs> you see that the whole goddess worship system manifesting itself in this, this recent meme of, you know, every few hours there's some new male celebrity who's either losing his career or getting, you know, fired from something because, you know, he said something to a woman or he did something to a woman. And that's not to say that, you know, as, as born-again Christians, we would approve of some type of, of sexual debauchery or something like that. But what we're seeing is that the conduct that the world has approved and said is okay for decades and yeah. centuries, all of a sudden in the last few weeks and months and hours even, it's now turned around. What Has Satan now decided that he is the captain of decency and morality, and he's 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 demanding that his followers, uh, you know, adhere to some level of decorum uh, amongst their interactions with women? No, something more is going on here. And what Satan has done is he's rewarded bad conduct by seducing people, men especially, especially men, because men are the soldiers in the army of God, the forefront, the point man for the attack on Satan's kingdom, which was obtained when Adam bowed the knee to his wife, God uses men to go out and make war. That's why men only can be pastors. That's why men only can, you know, go out and, and teach the Bible and become, you know, evangelists around the world. And so we see that Satan has a special plan to refute and to destroy the men who are the leaders of the army, the ground troops here on the earth, as there's a war and a battle between good and evil, and usually that will include either wealth, or that will include material gain, or that will include women. That's a you know huge stumbling block for men. Why? Because God knew that when Adam was in perfection in paradise, he named all the animals, all the animals loved and had friends, had a job, had interaction with the Lord face to face every day, but God says, it is not good for man to be alone. He wasn't alone. They were like all, every, every type of animal in the history of the world was there with him and would play with him. And God himself would come down and spend the day with him every day. But God said, none of these created creatures, these animals, nor myself, are comparable to him. He needs an help, meat or appropriate for him that's like him. So God put him to sleep, pulled out a rib, fashioned her into the very first woman. Eat this incredible creature that even the angels of heaven looked down and saw, oh my gosh, I'm abandoning heaven and going down and getting myself one of them, a daughter of Eve, you know, a woman. And so Satan has obtained or co-opted this amazing, most beautiful creation of all the wonderful things that God has created, sun, moon, stars, universe, quasars out in the, you know, the northern lights, all these things are beautiful and People take pictures of it and you stare at it forever. But none of it compares to the beauty that God put in his creative product and fashioning womankind. And as a result, Satan says, ah, that's the trick. That's, that's going to be the carrot that I'm going to use to sway the man. And so we saw that in the Old Testament, Samson and Delilah. We saw Samson was a judge in Israel giving up his leadership and authority role in Israel at the you know, direct behest of God. Why? Because he saw a pagan girl of the Philistines, Delilah. And he said to her, Dad, I want that girl. I said, no, you got all these other nice Jewish girls you could marry. He goes, no, she's, a, she's more hot than everybody. Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. And as a result, he got what he wanted. A beautiful, stunning girl who was a pagan. And eventually, he ended his days blind, enslaved, and in chains, and died in shame and disgrace having abandoned his service to the Lord for a really hot girl who turned around and betrayed him for a bunch of money. And so, you know, that kind of he kind of repeats itself time and again and again. And so this all ties into the mystery Babylon thing that began in the Garden of Eden. But then when we get to the rebuilding of the new world, after the Nephilim came down, and many of the Nephilim came down and decided to take on physical bodies. Why? Because they wanted 
what God gave to the sons of Adam. A woman, a wife. They took on physical bodies in the shape of men and kidnapped, raped, or cajoled, or seduced women of all whom they chose. The prettiest girls in class were living with the fallen angels, and they eventually impregnated and created what? A whole race of hybrid non-humanoids called the Nephilim, which began to overpopulate the earth and to push out and endanger the species that God had created called human beings. The human race was in danger, and so God supernaturally intervened with the flood of Noah and destroyed the world, and everything that breathed had to die to prevent the Nephilim from co-opting and replacing men on the earth, which God created the earth for men. And then, after the flood, civil government began. Noah and his three sons, sons Shem, Ham, and Jacob, began the nations. And at that same time, along came a man who was a you know, grandson of Noah by the name of Nimrod. And he became the first world emperor. He created a stargate. This Tower of Babel, where many historians believe the very first human blood sacrifice of children began and was conducted at the very top, the apex, the pinnacle of the Tower of Babel, because that was a way to empower the fallen angels, the spirit beings, to break through the metaphysical plane, the barrier that God had set up to keep the fallen angels, the wicked ones, from interacting with human beings, lest the whole disastrous turn with the Nephilim occur again. And it's believed that human blood sacrifice, especially with children, sodomization and raping of children, all began in ancient Babylon by Nimrod and was practiced specifically at the very highest point of the Tower of Babel. We see that the high places throughout the Old Testament in ancient Israel and in the pagan nations that surrounded Israel were always conducted in the high places. Why? Because they were trying to commune with devils, fallen angels. So they would build a place as high as possible in an attempt to build sort of a helipad or an airport landing spot for the fallen angels who were condemned to dwell in the air surrounding us in the second and first heavens because they were cast down and out of the third heaven, which is where God's throne is. So again, all of this ties into what we're studying in Revelation 17 and 18 with Mystery Babylon. Babylon was a real city. Oh, it was named Babylon, which means, you know, because there was a gate there called Bab El, which means the gate of God. The gate of God. This was the gateway, the stargate, this tower of Babel, for the gods of the air, the fallen, Satan and his lieutenants, to come down and interact with men yet again, giving them occultic knowledge and giving them the opportunity to advance their civilization beyond all which we've ever seen before. So Nimrod, being satanically inspired, made it a point to unite all the people of the world together in one nation. We had the very first United Nations was right here at the Tower of Babel where all the people of the world were together speaking one language under the control of a demon-possessed madman by the name of Nimrod, whose wife, Semiramis, was alleged to be maybe the most beautiful woman in the history of the world. And as a result, those two were able to establish a leadership and a rulership over all the peoples of the earth, with him as king and she as queen. And eventually God came down and confounded the languages to destroy the Tower of Babel and forced the people to separate out into different language-speaking groups, which eventually became different ethnic clans, which became the different nations of the earth. All human beings come from one father, Adam, so there are no different races of humans on the earth. All humans are a member of the human race because all humans are descendants of Adam and Noah. But they're different tribes, ethnicities, and now nation states because of the language barrier that God supernaturally created to force people to break up. Why? Because he didn't want you know, somebody with light skin to marry somebody with dark skin? No. There weren't people with light skin and dark skin because everybody looked kind of the same until they broke off and moved to different parts of the world. They all came from the father Adam, who was kind of a reddish brown looking man, because that's what the term Adam, which comes from the Hebrew word Edom, which means ready or earth uh, light, uh, comes from. So we don't get you know, the distinctives, the ethnic, phenotypic uh, expression of different 
ethnicities, different physical appearances until much, much later when the different people groups are separated out. But the people groups were separated out. Why? To protect the human race from the intrigues of Satan. It's much easier to co-opt one man and rule the whole world if all the whole world is under the control of just one man. But when you have many different nation states, some of them are going to be more godly than others. And so, you know, the terms and, you know, biblical history and, and the mythology are surrounding the Tower of Babel suggests that one of Noah's sons, who was in the ark with him, by the name of Shem, he came forward and he opposed Nimrod and what Nimrod was doing with children and the blood sacrifice in the Tower of Babel. And he had a battle with Nimrod, killed him, and chopped him into pieces. And as a result of that, his wife, Semiramis, was now left as the queen of Babylon. God scattered the people, people began to scatter out, but the people who remained in Babel uh, or Babylon, in the ancient Babylonian city, they were given a mythos uh, that was created by Semiramis that she was now the queen of this Babylonian empire, which it began to crumble because the people that couldn't understand, you know, separated out into the groups to go with people that could speak the language that they could understand. Um, and, you know, while, while she was mourning the death of her husband, she had sex with a pool boy and got pregnant. But she knew that the people in Babylon loved and admired her husband, who was considered a god in human flesh, and they would be upset with her for being unfaithful. Sort of like when Jackie Kennedy married Aristotle Onassis, the Greek multimillionaire, you know, billionaire, uh, shipping magnate. People, that's inappropriate. You should be mourning the husband, death of your husband forever. What kind of a woman are you? And so she didn't want that. So what she did is, when she got pregnant, you know, they didn't have abortion clinics in those days that you could just run out and take care of in five or ten minutes. So she created this story that her husband, Nimrod, who had died, had been resurrected as the son, and that he had shot a beam of sunlight into her cervix and gotten her pregnant by a beam of sunlight. And the son that she bore was, in fact, Tammuz, who she said was the resurrected form, reincarnated form of the physical body of her husband Nimrod, who is now the son. And it was through this mythos that we have the motif that spreads out from ancient Babylon to this very day, the mythos of the dying and resurrected sun god king. And so Tammuz grows up and he starts aspiring to the throne and Samiris doesn't want her son to take over the Babylonian kingdom that she established for herself. So she arranged to have her son killed um, after marrying him. Um, so it was weird because she married her son when he was 11 and then arranged for his death. But she said it was okay because really this isn't Tammuz, this is Nimrod back from the dead because he made himself come down through a beam of sunlight, impregnated me and came back as my son. So she was able to marry him and it was okay because it was really her husband who had died and come back to life. And so we got the dying and resurrected sun god king which was adopted into Freemasonic Luciferian worship and that's where the Freemasons come up with the legend of Hiram and Biff and the widow's, you know, son. They make reference to the, oh, you know, have mercy for the widow's son. Who has sympathy for the widow's son when you read pre-Masonic writings? They're talking about the mystery Babylon mythos created by Samiris, that the widow they're talking about is Samiris. You know, her husband died because Shem killed him because he was a pedophile and a murderer. And so she was the widow, and people were weeping for her, and then all of a sudden she was supernaturally able to give birth to a virgin, uh, as a virgin, she claimed she was a virgin. That's what all of the architecture in Washington, D.C. with the rotunda and, you know, the Washington Monument, phallic symbol at one end of the mall with the rotunda with the, the round swollen belly. It reenacts the, the idea that when the sunlight comes down, it bounces off the Washington Monument, shoots a beam of light into the capital rotunda, which impregnates and then gives birth to the new ruler of the world, which is really the Antichrist. It's a replaying of the story of uh, Semiramis becoming supernaturally impregnated by her sun god husband Nimrod, who had died and come back to life in the form of the beam of light that impregnated her turned into Tammuz, her son, and he came back to life. 
And so in Freemasonry, you get the story of Hiram Whip and the widow son, and says, who has you know, sympathy for the, the widow, widow son? The widow son is none other than Samiris' son, Tammuz, who eventually himself was killed, but secretly by the intrigues of her mother, who wanted to be the ruler of Babylon in the world. Um, and so when the son dies, you know, there's, there's a period of time, and we see that instituted even in the Old Testament when Israel started instituting pagan practices, where the death of Samiramis' son husband, Tammuz, was, was, was uh, mandated as a period of mourning. So she claims, oh no, a, a wild boar killed my son Tammuz, who was really my husband, back from the grave. So now we've got to have a new period of mourning for both Nimrod and Tammuz, and as a result, I'm going to order throughout the kingdom that cakes are baked in honor of, of Nimrod and Tammuz. And so uh, all the women throughout the land have to weep, shed tears, and make cakes. And we see that that slipped into ancient Israel and they were baking cakes for the Queen of Heaven because she had declared herself to be a goddess. She wasn't just a woman anymore. She could give birth supernaturally. She was a virgin who could give birth to a king who was also a god, so she had to be a goddess. So that's where the goddess worship system began to really take shape. And we see that, and we see that played out in the architecture on the National Mall with the Capitol Rotunda, the Washington Monument, and so, so on and so forth. And so we find out that that now takes place in ancient Babylon and works its way from there through the timeline that includes the call of Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai in Arabia, and the Ten Commandments, the establishment of the nation Israel, and eventually the captivity of the nation Israel to a new ruler in what we'll refer to as Neo-Babylon, the new Babylon that came, you know, more than a thousand years after the original Babylon. We had Neo-Babylon. The resurrection or the reestablishment of ancient Babylon, run by Nimrod and Semiramis, now under the control of the new kid on the block, who was the leader of the world, none other than Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the temple of Solomon, took Israel into captivity for 70 years in Babylon, you know, because uh, Sabbath rest rules and all of that, and you know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all taken captivity in Israel, and that's when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the metallic man, which is the four kingdoms of the world, which we looked at at length last week. And so now we find out that the ancient Babylon Ethos is now resurrected in the form of the Babylonian Empire, and then will be followed in quick succession by three other world empires. The chest of silver, which would be the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the hips of brass, which would be Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire, which then divided out into four, the four kings, Cassander, Lysimachus, uh, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, Seleucus controlling the land of Israel, and then another kingdom, which was depicted by two legs of iron. Remember, in, uh, you know, the, the Roman Empire, the Caesars came along, and it divided out into the east and the west, so it had two legs. The western branch set in the city of Rome, Eastern branch set in the city of Byzantium, also known as or renamed as Constantinople, when Emperor Constantine decided he wanted to move his kingdom eastward. And then we have, interestingly enough, we see that this fourth and final kingdom disappears, but then comes back again, not as a fifth kingdom, but as, as a reunited form of the fourth Roman Empire, and that has iron mixed with miry clay. And that's where most Bible scholars get the idea that this fourth kingdom resurrected will be the revived Roman Empire and will include human beings and also the return of the Nephilim. So hybrid humans will be part and parcel of this fourth world empire, which will be the resurrection of the fallen Roman Empire and will be headed by the man of sin talked about in Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, and nine, the Antichrist. And so with all of that, now we can sort of tie together what we saw, Revelation 17. A woman rides the beast, we, we read in Revelation 17, one through six. We saw that there was a depiction of what? Of the ancient 
Babylonian goddess, Semiramis, who, after the death of her husband Nimrod, created the myth that she was a goddess and that she would never die. And even after she died, the myth continued on. Oh no, she's not dead, she's in the sky. She went up into the sky. She is the mother goddess of the air. She is the queen of heaven. That's the title that Semiramis adopted for herself before her death. And long after her death, that same title, the queen of heaven, was used to promote the idea that she is all life on earth. You know, that's why, you know, just like in the Garden of Eden, you know, Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And that's what the etymology is behind the term Eve, the, the mother of, of life, you know. And so Semiramis sort of co-ops that and plays herself into this position as goddess. But what we're really looking at is Satan dressed in drag. He's adopted and co-opted this idea that there once upon a time there was a real woman named Samaritan, and she did die because she was a human being and not a god. But after she was dead, Satan used the legend surrounding her lifetime to create and to perpetuate the fallen Garden of Eden, Eve situation, the goddesshood of females. And so he was able to obtain from men the worship of a female deity, that worship which originally belonged to God, Satan was able to co-opt it in the most benign of forms, in the form of a beautiful, lovely woman. And so men began to worship the goddess for the first time. And that played itself out from ancient Babylon right through to Neo-Babylon. And in fact, even Israel, the chosen nation of God itself, and we'll look at that. And we saw in Revelation 17 last week, a woman rides the beast. What does all that mean? Well, we, we found out, for those of you that did the homework and looked at Dave Hunt's video on, on his, the book that he wrote, A Woman Rides the Beast, we found out that he pointed out that the woman in Revelation 17 isn't fighting with the beast like, oh, help, I'm, you know, I'm riding on a wild bull. No, she's controlling the beast. She's sitting on there happily dressed in scarlet and purple, you know, which are the colors of what organization? The Roman Catholic Church. And so we're finding supernaturally that God is prophetically telling us what is going to come down the line in the future. And the Roman Catholic Church really didn't come along until, you know, the 300s AD, right? After Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official state religion, the Roman Church that was now run by Emperor Constantine, who called himself Pontifex Maximus, the pontiff, the supreme pontiff, which title now is carried by what? The popes in Rome. And so we see it's not until the three and the four, the hundreds, five hundreds, eighty, that the Roman Catholic Church began to take shape, and it really didn't take shape in its present form until probably seven or eight hundreds AD. And so the idea that the Roman Catholic Church is the original Christian Church is a myth, but it's perpetuated by the Vatican because it's useful. And so we have the mystery Babylon goddess worship system that God refers to in Revelation 17, goodness forbid, cover your ears, <laughs> ears of your kids, he calls her the whore of Babylon. Whore, the woman who had engaged in illicit sexuality in exchange for wealth, riches, or something of benefit. And that's exactly what we see here. Samiramis, unfaithful woman, having sex with people other than her dead husband, Nimrod, but it also is more than that. The city of Babylon, a real place, is also the name of a false religious system that is centered on the worship of a goddess, the worship of a female as a deity because she has the ability to bring forth life. And so we see that that takes, it, takes shape in the form of Samiramis, the queen of heaven, and then perpetuates itself through all the other cultures of the world. We find out that many other nations adopted the sort of Samiramin uh, worship system Nimrod, Samiramis, and Tammuz in the ancient Tower of Babel in the 1800s BC. Uh, 400 years later, in 1200 BC, he became in Egypt, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And then, uh, another 600 years later, the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he promoted this whole idea uh, using different Babylonian names for the, the, the god, the goddess, and the son of the god and goddess. And then eventually, the Greeks adopted another 300 years later, and they changed the names of Nimrod, Samiramis, and Tammuz to Zeus, Artemis, or Diana, and Apollo. And then, when the Roman Empire subsumed or took over 
the Greek Empire, 300 years after that, they changed the name of, of Zeus, who was Osiris, to Jupiter, and the name of Isis to Venus, and again, they had Apollo as sort of their, uh, the son of, of the god and goddess. And then later, the Holy Roman Empire, Caesar is God, and eventually the Roman Catholic Church rises up from out of that around 325 AD, uh, the Edicts of Toleration, where the Christian Church becomes the official state church of Rome. Now, something very special happens at this time. Mary, who happens to be in the Bible, the mother of the biological body of Jesus, and who was a virgin at the time that she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, so that the corrupted Y chromosome of Adam would not infect the body of the Messiah, Jesus, when he's brought into the world, Mary is taken by the so-called Roman Catholic Church, which is really run by Satan in his Luciferian religious disguise, and Mary is made into this caricature. And this caricature is given the title, guess what the title is? The Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God. Wow! <laughs> so we find out that the Mary of Roman Catholicism is actually Samiramis of ancient Babylon. Satan, a clever guy, man, you gotta give credit where credit's due. He's worked this little lady throughout all these different cultures, throughout all these different empires, and boom, popped her right in front of our face in the form of a Christian woman. It is a Christian disguise for a satanic intrigue that has been going on now for almost, what, 4,500 years, almost five millennia. This God of space worship system, which really began 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden, has now appeared to us in the form of the Virgin Mary of the Catholic Church, the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God, who, as we, you know, we talked about last week, has temples and shrines throughout Europe dedicated to her, whereas her son, Dave Hum, was able to find only one. Just one. And I don't even know if that's up in the anymore. That's probably gone by now. So, we are living in a time where Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. So I see that, you know, uh, this guy, Frankel, who was a senator, mm -hmm. uh, a comedian becomes a United States senator in the first place, is beyond me, which is why Ben and I, when we have these debates, and I know our buddy from Ben is tuning in from Brazil, <laughs> this is why I say the entire electoral system, uh, and I don't mean the electoral college, I mean voting for candidates that run for office, it, it, it's a puppet show. It's a fool's errand, because the powers that be, run by Satan, control both sides against the middle. And so some, you know, body comedian becomes a United States Senator, and when he acts badly, which is what most entertainment Hollywood celebrities do anyway, he now is chased out of the Senate. But it was interesting when I was watching CNN and, and you know, uh, the national news tonight, they were saying, wasn't the people or the voters of Minnesota that decided we won't have a United States Senator representing us who engages in uh, inappropriate, uh, you know, disrespectful treatment towards women. No, it was decided by the Senate. The, regardless, the, the people of Minnesota be darned. Yeah, you voted them in, but we're taking them out. But it wasn't the entire Senate. It was the women of the United States Senate decided enough is enough. The men of the United States Senate apparently had no involvement in the decision-making process. But the women senators decided to come together, we're going to get this guy out, and that's it. And he was forced to resign, and he resigned, and he was clearly angry, and he was kicking and screaming on the way out the door. But, it, you know, it, it seems that the men who, you know, once upon a time in America were the dominant leadership force in our country, um, they had nothing to do with it. And the people of Minnesota who voted for this guy and sent him to Washington had nothing to do with it. It's just a bunch of women. And Washington, you see, they put their pictures up on the screen. These so women Washington. came together and decided. <laughs> we are seeing the shift, the paradigm from the paternalistic, patristic, male-centered, authoritarian uh, module or paradigm that God originally set up in the Garden of Eden that has now shifted away. The time of men, I've suggested to people before, is over. And it will not return until Jesus himself, the ultimate man, you know, God in human flesh, the Son of Man is the title he referred to himself. He didn't, you know, he didn't refer to I'm the Messiah, I'm the Christ. No, the title that Jesus chose was the Son of Man. I am an actual biogenetic, metaphysical descendant of the original man, Adam, which is why he's able legally to be the savior of the whole human race. Um, 
but the time with men is, 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 is over. So not a good time to be a guy, you know. <laughs> Women are uh, surpassing and have already surpassed men in terms of college graduates, uh, professional school graduates like medical school and law school, and, uh, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs. Women now, I'm being told, have outstripped men in terms of numbers of uh, CEOs of the major powerful uh, different, uh, you know, corporations of the world. And the same is true for, uh, you know, law schools, professional schools, and, and so the influence in the church, and, and in the church, Steve, is it, you know, Ben gave me this, this, this magazine, this Calvary Chapel magazine to look at, as well as some other stuff to look at, and I did, I did it the other day, Ben, and I was reading, even in there, and he was like, oh, you know, Calvary Chapel, they're, they're just trying to fight, and they're trying to do the right thing, and I saw in there an article. And it was subtle and done really well, and Ben probably never even noticed it, but it was a woman who was promoting the idea that while women can't be quote-unquote pastors, mm -hmm. they can teach the Bible to the congregation. And I was like, what? Where, where did you, what verse is that? I've read all the verses backwards and forth and taught it. Well, it's not in the Bible. It's, oh, well. it's, it's from the mouth of Kay Smith, who was... The wife, the widow of Chuck Smith, Smith, who's the founder of Calvary Chapel. So K. Smith, Chuck Smith's wife, says you can do it, you can do it. And so this woman went on to point out that, uh, you know, and not only her, but the, the wife of Raul Reese, who is, uh, you know, another one of the, the, the famous celebrity Calvary Chapel uh, pastors, and whose son is a heavy metal, black metal musician who, with uh, the lead guitarist of the Satanic Rock Group, Corn, decided to create a Calvary Chapel Satanic Rock Group called uh, the uh, Whosoever. Oh, yeah. And actually, they actually performed over at the Miami Beach Band Shelter on 72nd Street uh, and was paid for by my dollar on earth because the Calvary Chapel Miami Beach paid for it. And I went, and it was. It was the most satanic thing I'd ever been to, and I've been to a lot of secular music concerts, Prince, Christina Aguilera, you know, a lot of popular people, and it wasn't as nearly as as satanically scary as what I saw this Pastor Raul Reese and his son doing with this lead satanic guitarist from Corn, who claimed to have come to Christ and become a born again Christian, which made it all okay. So the wife of this Pastor Reese is also another one of the women of Calvary Chapel that say, well, women can't officially be pastors, but they can teach doctrine to the flock in, in the Calvary Chapel. So as long as it's women, you, you see that same motif being played out. We see it happen over at Calvary Chapel on Miami Beach, and that is clearly unscriptural. But you got pastors and the wives of pastors in the Calvary Chapel saying, it's okay, not because it's in the Bible, mm -hmm. but because Chuck Smith, who's now dead and gone on, it says it's okay, and if his wife says it's okay, and the wife of Raul Reese says it's okay, then it must be okay. Now, how you would allow your son to become involved with the Satanist, who, by the way, a couple of years after they did the concert over here on my dime, your dime, if you were giving tithes or giving donations to the chapel, they had to pay an exorbitant amount of money to get those guys to fly out here and do that concert and to rent out the band shelter. Turns out, a couple of years later, the guy who was from Corn, I forgot his name, Robert something or other. He says he wasn't a Christian all along. It was all a scam, and now he's back into Satanism, oh. and the joke's on Calvary Chapel. But the whosoever is the satanic Christian rock group that he established, is still going strong, and they're wow. performing like all over, not only the country, but all over the world. And I'm sure they've got an album out somewhere, and they're probably still performing uh, at, at the expense of Calvary Chapel congregations throughout the world. So, what I'm saying to you is this, the Word of God is what's right and what's wrong. That lays it out. It doesn't matter what Chuck Smith says, it doesn't matter what Chuck Smith's wife says, it doesn't matter what Benny Hinn says, it doesn't matter what Joel Osteen or Joel Osteen's wife says. What the Bible says controls. And when men come up in the Christian church and say something else, then we're supposed to use our discernment and say, well, hold on, I got a copy of the Bible, and the Bible says, thus and so saith the Lord. So when men or women say something different than what the Bible says, we got to disregard men, regardless of their titles, regardless of their influence and wealth, and go with what the Bible says. So what we're seeing, Steve, you could bring up a tremendous price. Wow. Women in the church. In the 1800s, there were no women leading any studies in the church or doing doctrine or writing books or appearing on TV shows. 
I listen to, you know, Christian radio. I just can't listen to it anymore because, you know, the Moody Christian radio station. Moody, uh, you know, started by Charles Moody in Chicago back in the 1800s, used to be this centerpiece of sound foundational biblical Christianity. Every time I turn on Moody Christian radio, some woman who is effusing emotionally about something that she's gone through, she's anorexic, or she had bulimia, or she was abused as a child, and she's with great tears and passion explaining some psychotherapeutic thing, or talking about how to raise the children. I can never tune in and find somebody teaching the Bible verse by verse, so I can say, hey, maybe I'll pick up a couple pointers and I'll throw this in in my Bible study. But no, it's always something about relationships, Something about, you know, sex life for Christians, or something about overcoming depression, or something about eating disorders, and it's women's issues running almost 24-7 on, on Moody Christian Radio. No longer are there men teaching doctrine. They're women teaching. But what they're teaching isn't the Word of God. It's some pseudo-Christian counterfeit. And I would suggest to you that proves that the Bible is correct and that we are living in the very last of the last days because now we see, and I remember uh, I saw a documentary in the 90s done by a Christian organization and they interviewed a couple of Wiccans, which witches, you know, from England. They said, the return of the goddess is at hand. They were saying this in the late 80s, you know, the return of the goddess is at hand. And, you know, I laughed at them like, you don't know, you know, Jesus isn't going to lie. It kind of, turns out they were right. And the Bible, in fact, agrees with them. The return of the goddess isn't at hand. It already occurred. And it's being instituted now. And we're only now seeing it with all these sex harassment complaints. Not that the guys are innocent, but that Satan used those guys and allowed them to obtain positions of authority as a reward for their debauched lives. Mm -hmm. And then when he gets, gets tired or they fulfill their, their usefulness, now they become the straw man mm -hmm. to destroy the image of all men everywhere for all time. And now the idea of men are bad people, women are victims and good people, and men are to be castigated and to be shunned unless they're feminists or homosexuals. Now, gay men and feminist men, they're going to do well in the New World Order, which has already taken place. But the guys, if you're not a feminist and you're not a homosexual, you got dark days coming for you, my friend. And so for all of us, you got to soldier up and just tough it out and wait for the rapture and hope that it comes soon. And if it doesn't, just you know, have to be strong and stand by your guns. But it's another perfect example of why what the Bible says about human sexuality, get married to one wife and have sex with her only, and you don't have to worry about any of these sexual harassment things unless somebody falsely accuses you of something, in which case you can't, you can't control that anyway. Um, so, you know, the problem is with these guys that have gotten themselves in trouble is they didn't apply the, the biblical standard of one man for one wife forever, mm -hmm. they were like a whole bunch of women, none of whom are my wife, for as much as I want, whatever I want. And then Satan, you know, just as he always does, ah, joke's on you, I'll let you have your fun, but now you got to pay the piper. Okay. Yeah. And when you pay the piper, it's always much more, more than, than you want. wanted to yeah. pay. <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, I went in to, to stay in sin for a little while, and it ended up staying longer than I wanted it, and it cost me a lot more than I wanted to pay. And that is the story of Satan's seduction of the man, because he knows the man is the lead, the centerpiece, the warrior that God has established to make war against the kingdom of the dark one. And we've been co-opted and distracted with sports and entertainment and sex and partying and drinking and becoming successful and money and wealth and all these things that have nothing to do with what our real mission in the world is, which is what? To go out and seek and save that which is lost. By doing what, Steve? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. Steve and I are out there on South Beach and our tracks with a little, uh, you know, little diagrams there trying to explain things because there are a lot of people that walk by down there on South Beach, you know, where we're set up across from the Versace mansion along the seawall at 11th and Ocean. We see people from all over the world every Saturday morning. And some of them, you know, some of them listen and they come and they're, oh, it's really interesting. They take the track and they ask questions about Jesus and some get saved. Most don't. Most yeah. kind of ignore it. The vast majority will take the track and maybe hopefully they'll read it later. But, you know, the vast majority aren't going to fall to their knees and accept Christ on the spot. Why? Because the Bible says that there is a way that leads to life and the few that find it will never die. But the Broad is the road to destruction. Many are those that go in thereby, but narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. 
So it's our job to help them find it. And so that's the mission of the church. So we saw that the woman rode the beast last week in Revelation 17. But guess what? After Satan uses the goddess-based worship system, which is what Mystery Babylon, Mystery Babylon is when the Babylonian goddess worship system of Nimrod was opposed by God, and God raised up the nation of Israel and started raising up prophets and raised up people like Noah and Shem and uh, opposed that thing, which resulted in human blood sacrifice, pedophilia, homosexuality, goddess worship. God opposed that openly, and it forced that type of worship, the goddess-based worship system, underground. Just like Freemasonry was Satanism, which was forced underground eventually and became the secret societies of today. So we find that the goddess-based worship system went underground. Once upon a time, in the British Isles, goddess worship and human child sacrifice run by the Druidic priests who would do you know, blood sacrifices of children at Stonehenge, which was an occultic shrine where people lost their lives. That was, that was done everywhere until Christianity made its way out of Judea into the rest of the world. And when Christian missionaries started coming into the British and the Emerald Isles and the Druid priests of Ireland and Britannia and Scotland were opposed by men of God, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, gave them grace to be able to prevail. And that's, you know, where the whole legend of St. Patrick, who, you know, now is a Catholic saint, but who once upon a time may have been just an evangelical Christian that was preaching the gospel, and then that name and those deeds gets co-opted by the Catholic Church, which is Satan putting on another disguise. Uh-oh, my whole Satan dressed in red goddess worship thing. Uh-oh, that's, that's being opposed by godly men who are coming forward to declare the word of God and turn the hearts of the people against this type of false worship system which requires us to kill our kids, to keep the gods of the air happy, to keep the goddess nourished and happy. We've got to kill our kids and commit sexual abominations. So the people decide, ah, oh, well, okay, if, if there's a way to get my crops to grow without killing my kids, I'd rather do that. Mm -hmm. And so Druidism began to fall into disfavor with the people of Britannia and the people of Ireland and Scotland. And so Christianity was eventually be able to flourish. The goddess-based worship system, which is where we get witchcraft, which is where we get Wicca, went underground and had to go into hiding. And that's why we have the castles in Scotland and all these secret rituals being done in there. And Christianity took predominance over uh, the British Isles and most of Europe. But then along comes the Roman Catholic Church, pseudo-Christianity, with a secret crypto form of goddess worship, disguised in the person of the so-called Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God. And so here we are again. Now we've got a Christianized form of the ancient Babylonian pagan worship of a goddess figure in the heavens who is really Satan dressed in drag, but now it's in a religious drag with a cross. Okay, so here we have the Virgin Mary, Queen of Heaven, Mother of God, and really Satan dressed up like a girl, but only keep wearing religious robes and a cross now, and very pious, you know. And so that has played itself out, and eventually, as Europe began to become influenced by the Roman Catholic Church first, the Roman State Church system, and then eventually the Anglican Church system broke off from that and controlled England, and you know, when it spread to the United States of America, it became the Episcopalian Church, or Episcopalianism, which is Anglicanism in, you know, in America disguise. Uh, we found out that that form of Christianity had no strength to it because the Lord wasn't with it. And we saw the seven letters of seven churches and the churches that weren't doing well. And eventually, Christianity died out in Europe. And it's pretty much dead now. And it's been replaced by what? Wicca. Witchcraft. The worship of the goddess system. The worship of Gaia. Mother Nature. Samirimus in all these different names is being worshipped, which is really just Satan, as I said before, dressed in drag, stealing from himself worship that belongs to God. And so, the woman riding the beast, that was used and will be continued to be used, because now the goddess space worship system is being popularized, not just in Great Britain, not just in the British Isles, but also here in the United States of America. It's growing in predominance. And it, for the secular-minded people in the United States, it's disguised as feminism or as equal rights, or girl power. You know, we, we, we always see the entertainer, whether it was Christina Aguilera, Beyonce, or Lady Gaga from girl power, yeah, you know. You know, Miley Cyrus, girl power, you know. 
where does all this coming from? You know, all of a sudden it just popped up out of nowhere. What does this have to do with pop music or rock music or being able to dance well on stage? It is part and parcel of the satanic Luciferian entertainment system, which is based in Southern California, which I saw on television. I know you know, oh, Southern California is on fire. I was like, man, it's some kind of symbolic. It's almost symbolically, just you know, just like, just like the, the satanic evil entertainment propaganda machine that's based in Southern California going down in flames. I was like, man, it's just it just brought to mind images of the Book of Revelation and how the judgment of God is going to fall on the world system. That brought the woman that rises, rides on the beast to prominence. And we see her rising to her prominence now. And she's riding on that beast system. The beast is what? The Antichrist, the individual, and the Antichrist one world governmental system, which has as part and parcel of uniting the people together a one world religious faction, which is a false religious system, which is really Satan obtaining God's worship, but is disguised as what? A pseudo-Christian format with a feature of goddess worship added to it. False Christianity, pseudo-Christian worship, with a goddess worship system instituted in it. Which religious organization on earth mm. has that? The largest one, the Roman Catholic Church. Over a billion people served and growing. And that is supposedly a form of Christianity, but yet it has a goddess that's worshipped, a queen of heaven. They call her mother of God. How dare they? The co-redemptrix of the human race. They're Virgin Mary, La Virgin, you know, if you will. And so we see that that's growing in predominance, and it's going to continue to grow in predominance until we get to the second half of Daniel's 70th week. And after that, once the Antichrist is assassinated and comes back to life, Satan is dwelling in him directly. He doesn't need a false pseudo-Christian religious-based system anymore. And he isn't going to allow the people of the earth to worship any goddess because he doesn't have to wear it. Like, I don't have to wear these silly you know, women clothes anymore. I can come out and be who I am. I can be Satan in human flesh and have the world worship me as God. And no longer do I have to wear my silly Halloween disguises and costumes and use all these aliens to steal worship. I'm going to obtain worship for myself, and you're going to worship Satan directly at the second half of the tribulation period, the last 42 months. So he doesn't need the woman anymore, and he destroys her. And we're going to get to that now. So now, let's go ahead. Now we've got a little, my little intro ran longer than, than I wanted it to, but, you know, there right. you go. So let's take a look real quick, and uh, somebody read just real quick. Uh, Revelation... Steve, yeah. read 17, Revelation, I mean, 1 through 6, and then 16 through 18. In, I'm sorry, chapter 17? 17, okay. just to recap. Okay. 1 through 6, and... And then 16, 17, and 18. Okay. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Let me stop right here before you continue on. Mm -hmm. Now, the four views of Babylon, when we use that term Babylon and Mystery Babylon, the four most predominant views, Mystery Babylon is what? It's Rome, the city of Rome where the Vatican is headquartered. That's what the fun promotes. Uh, there's an idea that, well, Babylon is the rebuilt city of ancient Babylon in Iraq. That's the position that Joe Chambers takes. There's others who have argued that Babylon is really a metaphor for none other than New York City, because New York City is the most important city on the face of the earth right now in terms of influence and power, and has been for a long time. So some people say that when the Bible and Revelation is referring 
to uh, Babylon. It's, it's referring to New York City and the World Trade Center and the construction of the World Trade Center and people being able to see the smoke rise from the World Trade Center from the Hudson River and the East River and New York Harbor. You know, it's a fulfillment of Revelation 18. I, I tend to, eh, it was a nice try, but I don't think so. Um, and then finally, you know, the fourth view, that Babylon is the mystery Babylon system, which is what? The rebuilt city in Iraq plus the Roman false church system, which is headquartered in Rome. And so I think that that, the Chuck Missler position, which incorporates with it both Dave Hunt and Joe Chambers' position, is, is the correct one. Um, and so now, Steve, go ahead and read for us uh, verses 16, 17, and 18 of Revelation 17. And ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Okay, so we see the ten horns of the beast, you know. We say, oh man, wait a minute, what's that talking about? We're talking about the Antichrist and his new one world governmental system. And we, we saw it laid out in Revelation 17 that, you know, there were eight kings and kingdoms and, you know, then there were ten. And we, we had studied before when we studied about the Antichrist that apparently the, the world is divided out into ten regions run by ten regional governors, three of whom will rebel against the Antichrist when he rises up through the popularity of the false Roman Catholic pseudo-Christian goddess worship church system that's going to promote him not only as this spiritual wonderkin, but the guy who can save the world from, from loss and destruction. Three of the governors of those ten regions, or those ten horns, will rebel against the Antichrist. The Antichrist will destroy those three rulers, and there will be seven left over. And then those seven regional world governors will unite together, throw their weight behind the Antichrist, and so the ten horns will come together and Antichrist will be your man. And so then we saw, you know, the prophetic references of Revelation 17, 10, about seven kings, five have fallen, you know, and uh, one is and the other has not yet come. That is making reference, I believe, without question, when you look at Revelation 17, 10, which you can read for us real quick, Steve. Yep. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. The other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. I think that's talking about the Roman Empire. That's why we and many other Bible prophecy scholars believe that the Antichrist comes or uh, rises out of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is resurrected and becomes the new world order, one world government. But that verse in Revelation 17, 10 is talking about five kings. You know, you know, there's seven kings. You know, five uh, have fallen. As of 96 AD, when the book of Revelation was being written by John, there had been five previous Caesars, Augustus, Claudius, Caligula, Tiberius, and Nero. At the time that John was writing the book of Revelation 96 AD, there was one who was presently in existence, one is. That was Domitian. And then he talks about, John writes about, the other has not yet come. Who is that talking about? The seventh one. That's talking about the Antichrist, who will come from a revived form of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire falls into disrepair for 2,000 years and then re reunites together. And now the final of these seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. How short of space? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, my friend. Four and a half months. Forty-two months. The first half of the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, he's going to use the false goddess-based pseudo-Christian worship system of false Christianity. A woman writes the beast. Remember, at this point, she's on top. Mm -hmm. He's using that false religious system to gain acceptance in the world. Maybe they're promoting, the Pope gives a speech and says, this guy, you know, you know, Prince so-and-so of Slovenia is the greatest leader that ever lived. We should consider his plans for him. Uniting the world together, and you know, you know, one world currency, and to you know, uh, limitless energy that's cheap and easy and doesn't pollute. 
And so eventually, during the first three and a half years of that 70th week, he's consolidating through the false religious system where a woman is riding the beast, which incorporates goddess worship of the Roman Catholic Church, which is really ancient Babylon, which is really the fall in the Garden of Eden. Um, and so after he consolidates his power through that false religious system, he gets assassinated, comes back from the dead, and all the nations of the earth say he must be a God-man who can stand up against a man who can come back from the dead. And all the world wonders after the beast. Now, the last 42 months of this program, you don't need the false religious yeah. system. False Christianity, goddesses, popes, do away with all that stuff. Satan himself will be living in the body of this hybrid Nephilim entity that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. Satan himself will be God in human flesh, but a fallen God, just like Jesus was God in human flesh, Antichrist will be Satan, the God of this world, in human flesh. And he will obtain worship for himself directly, but only for 42 months. And then, mm -mm, next week we'll see that, you know, Mystery Babylon gets her, her comeuppance this week, which we're going to look at in a second. Next week, Antichrist and Satan himself will get theirs as we examine the return of the king. But I get ahead of myself and uh, just tell you that so you can be excited and read ahead. So, okay, so now with, with the time we have left, let's, let's jump on ahead, Steve. And since you did such an outstanding job of reading that, why don't you go ahead and start us up? on uh, Revelation chapter 18, which is where we're at now. And Revelation 17 and 18 really has to be taught together because they're yeah. really companions of one another. It's just because I talk so much we don't have enough time to get it all in in one teaching, lest you be here for six hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so read uh, for us verses 1 and 2, Steve. And after these things, I saw another angel. Oh, let me yes. stop you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, read the last three verses of Revelation 17 and then run that in. So, okay. Yeah. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the word of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Chapter 18. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Okay, so what we see then, basically, is that at the end of Revelation 17, God uses the Antichrist, one world government system, to destroy his nemesis, Mystery Babylon, which has been bouncing around since the time of Nimrod. And it says, you know, uh, that the harlot is really destroyed. It says, you know, uh, verse 14, these will make war with the Lamb. And, you know, it talks about the waters are peoples, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns, which you saw in the beast, these will hate the heart. Antichrist is going to turn his regional governors against this false mystery Babylon system, goddess worship and all of that, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Satan, like I said before, with all these you know, male puppets that are being paraded across the screen for sexual harassment, he's going to do the same thing to the goddess worship system. The goddess worship system is, is useful for now, for stripping the authority from men, Objectifying men, causing all women everywhere to hate men, and we're the evil guys and bad guys and whatever. And it obtains for himself power and authority. But when God's worship is outlived its usefulness, he's going to do away with that too. And he's going to make God's worship desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Thinking of Southern California. Isn't That's it? Good. How? Why? Because <laughs> God is the ultimate puppet master. For God himself has put it into the hearts of these satanic servants to fulfill whose purpose? God's purpose. God wants to get rid of that goddess worship system because he really hates it. He's going to trick Satan into doing it for him. And he says he's going to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind, to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God, not Satan, are fulfilled. And the woman that thou sawest is that great city which reigned over the city, over the kings of the earth. What city is that? Well, Dave Hunt says that's Rome, a city built on seven hills. And which may, according to Joe Chambers, be removed from Rome 
and eventually relocated into uh, the plain of Shinar in uh, Iraq, which is where original ancient Babylon and Neo-Babylon stood as a real city. And so Steve says that an angel comes down in the first two verses of Revelation 18 that says, Fell, fell, or fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great and has become a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and hateful bird. So when God says something's going to be done, it's as good as done even before an angel's coming down from heaven and he says, Babylon, Babylon the Great is destroyed. And, you know, you know, Samiris looks up like, what are you talking about? I got my army here, I got my churches, I got people worshiping, what do you mean I'm, I'm done? When God says it's going to be over, it's over before it's done. And so we find out that the, the destruction of Babylon is now prophesied by the angel that comes down. And if you would, Genevieve, uh, or whoever can get to it first, Isaiah chapter 13. Let's take a look and see what the Old Testament has to say, I think, about this same little period of time. And while you're looking for that, Steve, flip over, or, or Albert, if you could, maybe you can flip over to Jeremiah chapter 50, Albert. And, and Isaiah 13. Okay, read for us 19. Through 22, while uh, Albert, Jeremiah 50. Yes, sir. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the shadows, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom, Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there neither shall the shepherds make their food there. But will the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures and owls, and shall dwell there, and satyrs uh, shall dance there. And so what we're finding out is that after God destroys the city of Babylon, which was the headquarters for this one world mystery Babylon system, it's going to be inhabited, strangely enough, by these transgenic monsters. It's in some translations, it says doleful monsters will dwell there. And satyrs will be there. Satyr, we already discovered, was a goat man, a hybrid monstrosity that was really created by the fallen angels who interacted with human beings and learned how to contaminate and crossbreed human DNA with animal DNA to make goat men that become the myths and the legends of monsters of old. The Bible says in Babylon, an actual city of Babylon, they're going to dwell there. That lends credence to the idea that the mystery Babylon system headquartered in Rome may well be removed back to the city of its origin, the ancient city of Babylon in the plain of Shinar in Iraq. And then that is eventually destroyed when God does what he does in Revelation chapter 18. Nothing's going to be left except the transgenic monsters, the, the satyrs and the goats, and the Arabian won't pitch his tent there anymore. Human beings won't be going there because it'll be uh, this, this terrible set piece where people understood that God's judgment has fallen on this place. Now, uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 50, verses uh, 12 through 13, first feet, and then uh, how to go to 26. 39 to 43. Uh, Jeremiah 50. And Albert, while, while he's doing that, you got, you, you got it, Albert? Yeah, you tell me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Your mother shall be sore, confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed to behold. The hindermost of the nation shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Every one that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. See, the, the city of Babylon, I believe, this didn't happen to ancient Babylon, and it didn't happen to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Hmm. The Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar that had the seven hanging gardens and all that, it kind of just fell into disuse. And even Peter, you know, went, went there and says, you know, he went to Babylon. He says, oh, he's metaphorically talking about Rome. Maybe not. He may have gone to the ruins of the ancient city of Babylon and preached the gospel there. The city of Babylon never received the kind of judgment that Albert just, just told us about. Albert, take a look at uh, verse 26 of Jeremiah 26. Read that for us. Come against her from the utmost border. Open her storehouses. Cast her up as heaps. 
and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Ooh, man, that sounds very final. How about 39 and 40? What does it say there? 39 and 40. Wow. Therefore, the wild beast of the desert with the wild beast of the islands shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein. And that shall be no more inhabited for ever. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbors' cities thereof, said the Lord, so shall no man abide there. Neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And the term owl, I find it interesting to know that the owl is the symbol of the New World Order. It's a creature that symbolizes Satanism and the occult. You know, the owl, uh, Moloch, if you look in the Bohemian Grove, you know, the video that, that the famous Alex Jones YouTube video where they went into the Bohemian Grove to see satanic rituals being performed by the leaders of the world in front of a gigantic statue of an owl where a child is being sacrificed to the flames in front of a giant owl statue. The owl has oft times in the past been an animal symbol of Satan himself. That's where the, the sort of mythology of the owl being the wisest of all the animals and like, who who even is looking around. Because Satan, the wise one, comes down to Eve in the Garden of Eden with all this occultic knowledge that Eve didn't know anything about. He's like, oh, I got all this covered. But I'll share with you in exchange for your loyalty. And that's what the occult is all about, obtaining hidden knowledge to you know, obtain advancement over your enemies or advancement over your rivals. So the mentioning of the owls and the satyrs and the monsters in this city of Babylon cannot be talking about ancient Babylon. It must be talking about a revived Babylon, which as of yet hasn't occurred. But when Saddam Hussein was in power, he was be rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon in Iraq, and in, in Iraq, and, and putting his name alongside the name of Nebuchadnezzar on the stones in the temple that was surrounding the Tower of Babel, which still, you know, um, that that still stands there. The silver, the gate of Babel, is still standing in Iraq. So we we see that God is pronouncing the judgment upon this wicked city. So now we're back around to you, Steve. Uh, jump back into Revelation uh, 18. You said the gate of Babel? Yeah, Babel. It's a gate. It's this, this giant gate that uh, Saddam Hussein spent millions of dollars to refurbish hmm. and to rebuild. And it was the gate that allowed people to enter into, it was believed, the, 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 the city of Babylon, oh, which wow. is where the Tower of Babel was located. And the term Babel means literally not confusion. It eventually came to stand for confusion. Why? Because God did something special. But the word is a Semitic word. It means the gate of God or the gods. This is the gateway for the gods to enter in to the human space-time continuum and interact with human beings just like Satan did with Eve in the garden. And after that, God shut down the pineal gland in front of the brain and prevented human beings from interacting with the fallen spirit beings for the protection of the human race. Mm -hmm. But ancient Babylon and Nimrod and the like, they found a way to open up a stargate, a Bob L, a gateway to the fallen gods of the air. And that's what really was going on in ancient Babylon. So, read for us verses 3 through 6. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the, abu through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. Reward, well, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Wow, that sounds bad. When you come to feel to the double by God, that that can't be good. good. So let's let, now let's jump over into Genesis, Albert, and let's let you and Genevieve give us a couple of the verses from Genesis. So Albert, start out with Genesis chapter ten and read from me verses six through ten, and Genevieve flip over to Genesis chapter eleven, and I'm going to have you read. 
4 through 9. So Genesis 10, 6 through 10, Albert. The generation of Ham. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. I love how you read. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Hav Ela, mm -hmm. and Sabta, and Ra'ama, and Sabtesha, and the sons of Ra'ama, Sheba on Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. Mm -hmm. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalmid, Kalmet, and the land of Shinar. There you go. This is our guy. Nimrod. Right here, chapter 10. In chapter 10, you're like, where did he get this? This is all mythology. <laughs> no, it's right there in Genesis right. chapter 10. Nimrod, who was a descendant, of Noah and, and, and wow, his sons. Look at that. Yeah. He established the first world empire, the first great nation state cities, Babylon, Iraq, Akkad, all of those great cities of the plain of Shinar were established by Nimrod. And he united all those people together and ruled over them all. And the Bible refers to him as a great hunter. Uh, before or against the Lord. Mm -hmm. He was considered, he was called there a mighty one. The term there in Hebrew is what? Giborim. It's the same Hebrew word used to describe the Nephilim. Nimrod engaged in the Tower of Babel in some kind of occultic ritual that sexually and genetically defiled himself so that he was able to change his DNA to change himself from being a regular Adamic man to make himself into a Nephilim Superman, a God-man, which is why the legend of Nimrod, which was retold later in the, as Sargon, you know, he was referred to Sargon of Akkad, he was mythologized as a God-man because he really did something through an occultic, genetically defiling sexual ritual in the Tower of Babel that allowed through the occultic knowledge, the advanced metaphysical and genetic inf information that Satan was able to provide for him, he was able to turn himself into a Nephilim. That's what the Mark of the Beast is going to do to everyone who takes the Mark of the Beast. And anybody that does take that Mark of the Beast from Revelation chapter 13 will, just like Nimrod, change into a God-man, a Superman, but will no longer be an Adamic man and will automatically be disqualified for born-again salvation through Jesus Christ. So Nimrod became like the first king. Well, the Assyrian kingdom, right? He was the first world emperor. The he first world the first emperor. Ruler. And you could argue, and well, I guess you could say he's the first king in the world because he was the one guy in charge of everything. And they didn't have kings in those days. Mm -hmm. Everybody was under, you know, the, the rule of the Lord, uh, unless they rejected it. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we had, that was Genesis chapter 6 and 10. Now, we did a great job of giving that to us. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 11. Read for us verses 4 through 9, Jeremy. And they said, go to let us, go to let us build. No, no, no. And they said, go to. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, let it, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Oh, wow. Now, what is she just reading to that us? That Nimrod was like the theater. Well, the, the, the deeper point there is what? The Tower of Babel is a real place. Yes. It wasn't make-believe. It really is there in Genesis 11. And who is talking? God is talking to Jesus. This is the Trinity in the Old Testament. So when you have the individuals like, uh, gosh, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, who 
yeah. dispute the fact that there's a trinity in the Bible, and the one that's Pentecostals who claim that there's no God, Father, and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is saying to God the Son, Jesus, go to, which is kind of an old turn of a phrase, okay? Let's go. Mm -hmm. Let us go down. Jesus and God the Father go down to Babylon to take a look to see what's going on. And they see, oh, hey now, the people are one. They've been united by King Nimrod, the ruler of the whole world at this point. Now nothing that they put their mind to, to accomplish, can be prevented from it. It sounds just like what happened in the Garden of Eden. After the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden, God said to the angels, you know, especially one angel, who was given a flaming, fiery sword turning every way, he's like, you better go down there and guard the tree of life, lest Adam and Eve and their children reach out and take up the tree of life and live forever in their fallen state which means, like Satan, they would have to be sent to the lake of fire and will be ineligible for redemption. So God sent an angel down, set him up with a flaming sword. Angels in the Bible, they aren't literally like, they aren't safe and fuzzy, cuddly, nice people. They're soldiers that are willing to destroy and to eliminate the opponents of God by whatever means necessary. So one of them was sent down the guard of the tree of life to protect. Oh, that's heavy. Right? What he just said. Isn't that something? No, that's heavy, man. Yeah, and it's true. You know, we're living in a war, and in war people get hurt. Not supposed to build things. No. And fat, cherubic, rubenesque that's paintings of angels with robes and little little male penises and, and belly fat and wings and blonde hair. And all, all that nonsense is from the, the, the perversion of Satan through the minds of men. Angels are soldiers and warriors, and one was set up in the Garden of Eden to prevent Adam and Eve from eating of the tree of life, which would mean they would become eternal beings trapped in their fallen, fallen bodies, and those fallen bodies would live on forever, and they'd be trapped in them forever. So God sent them out of the garden and set an angel up in the Garden of Eden to guard the way of the tree of life. The tree of life will make its reappearance very shortly, and we'll see now that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we will be freely given, given the opportunity to partake of it and live forever. But in our new, redeemed, non-fallen, non-sinful bodies. And so, we find out that the Tower of Babel was a real place that was built by Nimrod, who was a satanic, perverted, Nephilim God-man. And so, God said, oh my goodness, now they're united together, the people is one. And whatever they set their mind to at the direction of Satan, they'll be able to accomplish. So what did God do? He confounded their languages. That's why the term Babel, <coughs> which is really literally the gateway of God, which is where the fallen angels would come to interact with human beings, became sort of a, a euphemism for confusion. The term, oh, what is that guy babbling about? What's that babbler saying? That comes from Genesis chapter 11, where God confounded the language of the people who lived in the city called the gate of God, or the gateway of the fallen gods of Satan. The god of this world, Satan, would come in and interact with human beings, so they named the city Babel, which was the gateway of the gods. It later, after God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ came down and confounded the languages of the people to prevent them from becoming the internal slaves of Satan and the other fallen angels, people couldn't understand one another's language. It was a supernatural event because they all spoke the same tongue. Some people think it was Hebrew. It was some type of Semitic tongue, for sure. And all of a sudden, people were speaking, you know, Asian tongues and Korean and the precursors of English and all of that, and they couldn't understand one another. And as a result, the Tower of Babel and the One World Government set up there fell apart instantaneously. And people began, come on, let's get out of here. Something's going on. This is creepy, you know. And Steve's looking at me like, okay. Uh, no intended, you know. And, and, and so the people that could understand Spanish, they went off together. The people that understand, you know, the native Chaldean tongue would go off with the other people that could understand the native Chaldean tongue. Somebody that spoke some kind of a precursor to uh, Chinese or Vietnamese, which is what Vaughn will be encountering in a couple of days, um, they all went off together because they couldn't communicate. Let's get out of here. Anybody that understood that said, okay, let's go. Hey, well, I understand this. there's a lake 
and you know there's this fertile plain we, we can set up some farms over by such and such and so everybody heard and could understand that would go off with that group and people began to intermarry together if you couldn't understand your wife I mean your wife wouldn't be able to tell you what to do if she couldn't understand your language so <laughs> so she had to you know marry a guy that understood the language otherwise she couldn't tell him how to run the family so anyway that's what happened and that's why the term Babel no longer is considered or understood by people to be what it really means in the Semitic tongue, the gateway of the gods. It's now considered confusion, battling. You're battling. I don't understand. What are you battling about? It's confusing. You know, I heard about, I just had a flashback. Okay. When I was a little boy, maybe Jenny could confirm this, when I was a little boy, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, my father would always say to me, uh, no se son Hmm. In Don't Spanish he said that? Yeah. Well, did he speak Spanish? Yeah, I speak, right, read it and write it from Oh, your dad? I'm saying your dad was Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it says from Babylon. And he would always say this to me, you know, when I was a little boy. Of course, I never knew what it meant. Until like right now. Yeah, yeah, that's what he was saying. Right? Was he Catholic, Catholic right? Yeah. Was he Catholic? Yes. Okay, so he's probably was Cuban Catholic or whatever. No, Argentinian Catholic. So he, 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 he was familiar with these phrases. And, and some of our, our common catchphrases come from mm -hmm. Babylon comes from the Bible itself, you know. A number of, of different phrases I could I could raise to you right now if we had the time. You'd be like, wait, is that from the Bible? Yes, sir, it sure is. So but with the time we have left, uh Zechariah chapter five, Steve, read for us verses five through eleven. Now we get another depiction, a uh, description of Babylon in the Old Testament, a real place. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what it is. See what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whether do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there on our own base. Zechariah in Zechariah 5, I believe, is prophetically receiving a vision of what's going to happen during the 70th week of Daniel, the Great Tribulation period. We see a metaphysical, metaphorical spirit woman who is considered unclean and in a wicker basket. And the wicker basket has a top placed on it, and after that, it has like a weight put on it so she can't get out. And then we see two angels. But the angels aren't like the angels in the Bible who are always referred to as men. We saw, you know, Steve talked about, you know, there was an angel in Revelation 18, 1 and 2, and he was referred to as a he. There aren't any girl angels working on behalf of the Lord anywhere in Scripture. But yet, we have here two female angels. And they have the wings of a stork. A stork is an unclean animal in the law of Moses. And so we know by virtue of the fact that the wings are stork wings, that this is some kind of an unclean hybrid monstrosity that God considers an abomination. These fallen angels are demonic entities, no doubt as a result of Satan's genetic intrigues, and they're doing what? They're providing her with air transportation from one place to another. What place might that be? Might be from the Vatican in Rome to the new headquarters for this mystery battle. The same woman that's in this basket, I think it's the same woman that we saw riding on the beast in Revelation 17 last week. There's a woman that rides the beast. Again, not a literal single woman who is in charge of everything, but the metaphysical, metaphorical spirit woman that in the spirit world God sees and lets the prophet see. This is the woman that's riding on the beast, the goddess worship system. Now that woman is in a basket and she's being transported from one place to another place. That place, I think, is the city of Rome, where Dave Hunt correctly said the Mystery Babylon system would be headquartered at the Vatican in the beginning. 
but I think Chuck Missler and Joe Chambers are also correct, and that that false goddess-based pseudo-Christian cult system is transported from the city of Rome and the Vatican to the plain of Shinar. Where are they taking her? To the plain of Shinar. Where is Shinar? Shinar is the county in which the city of Babylon was built, Iraq, Akkad, all of the great cities of Nimrod were on the city are on the plain of Shinar and built right there. And this mystery Babylon who's riding the beast in Revelation 17 is now being transported back to her ancestral homeland where they can build for her her own base, a shrine dedicated to goddess worship in the rebuilt city of ancient Babylon, which eventually will be destroyed. I can Zechariah 5, man, that's powerful stuff, man. Okay, so now let's jump back in if we will, um, who are we at? Uh, 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 who just read? I'm just read. Okay, so Alpha. Genevieve's here, right? Oh, wait. Mm-hmm. Okay, Genevieve, read for us Genevieve 7 and 8 of uh, Revelation 18. Yeah, I like Zechariah. He's pretty heavy. Zechariah's a heavy dude, man. That's a covetedness, huh? It's powerful. Powerful. Zechariah. I would suggest reading 5 and then take a look at it. 11, 12, and, 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 and 14 as well. That's some powerful stuff there. Seven and eight. Yes, read uh, Revelation 18, verses 7 and 8. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall, no, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death or mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judged her. Okay, who is he talking about? Not talking about a single individual woman, we're talking about the mystery Babylon, the horror of Babylon, a spirit being who inhabited Samiramis, inhabited Isis, you know, inhabited, you know, all these things, who calls herself the Queen of Heaven, is now you know, being judged by God. And God is saying, like, you know, she's made, you know, had sexual relations with the kings of the earth. She seduced them. And we're going to make her bed a bed of iniquities. This is referring to the queen of Babylon, who is also the queen of heaven, who is also the Catholic Virgin Mary, who takes for themselves the title of the queen of heaven. And it's also Samiramis, Ishtar, Isis, Mother Earth, the goddess, Wicca, Gaia, all of those titles and names that are applied to the goddess worship system is really the same person. And God is saying, I'm about to judge. And so now, Albert, if you would, Jeremiah, since you're doing so well with us in the Old Testament, prophet Jeremiah for us, Albert. Huh? Yeah. yeah. I was clear my ears. What? Turn to Jeremiah, chapter 7. And while he's doing that, Steve, uh, flip over to Isaiah chapter 47. Seven. Read 17 and 18. Sacred battle, not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Now what are they talking about? Well, what's happened is the mystery Babylon worship system that we talked about, and remember I told you how, uh, you know, uh, Samirimus created the mythology that she was the queen of heaven, the goddess of the sky, and that after she died, she became the queen of heaven and the mother of the earth. That spread forth from ancient Babylon through the pagan nations that were in existence at the time Israel was founded, and even ancient Israel was infected by the satanic agents that corrupted God's own chosen people to begin to practice pagan idolatry by worshiping Samirimus in the form of the Queen of Heaven. And so, even after the temple of God was built in Israel, you know, God is saying to the prophet Jeremiah, do you see what they're doing? Even in the house of the Lord, they're baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Remember I told you that Samirimus started the, uh, the idea in ancient Babylon that 
to commemorate the death of both her husband and her resurrected husband, her son, who was also her husband, her second husband, Tammuz, after she arranged for him to be killed, she required everybody in the kingdom of Babylon to mourn for a period of time and to bake cakes. You know, so like on your birthday, you make a birthday cake and give it to somebody to honor his death. They had to bake cakes and mourn for a period of time. The women in Israel, but it's forbid, they are, there you have feminism raising this ugly head, even in the city uh, of the great king, even in the nation created by God. The women began practicing goddess worship by baking cakes to the queen of heaven and mourning and weeping for Tammuz. And so Albert just kind of told us about that. So, uh, you know, yeah, now, now flip over, if you would, Albert, to Jeremiah chapter 44, a few chapters away, and read for us 16 through 19 of Jeremiah 44. And as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done we and our fathers our kings and our princesses in the cities of judah and in the streets of jerusalem for then had for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil but since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her Without our men. Wow. Oh, I see that. Israel is doing pagan worship, boys and girls. Goddess worship is happening in the house of the Lord in Israel. Now, what Christian church in this day burns incense to the Queen of Heaven? Doesn't have it in the church. There you go. I smell it. There you go. They got the that incense. Smell, isn't it? Yeah, you know, so it's the smell of Satan. And so don't be deceived by the sweet perfume. Mm -hmm. I ain't seen no burning incense to the Queen of Heaven in any Baptist church I've ever been in. But in the Catholic church, sure enough, you got the priest dressed up as the priest of Babylon waving the censer with incense. And it happens to this very day. And it's happening supposedly, again, in the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord in the Old Testament is what? The temple. Mm -hmm. Now the house of the Lord is what? The structure, the building's called the church. And we see just like in ancient Babylon, in ancient uh, times, in the house of the Lord, in temple, the temple of Solomon in Israel, the Queen of Heaven was worshipped by burning incense to her. Now we see, in the house of the Lord has replaced the temple, the churches, that the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodoxy burns incense to the very same Queen of Heaven. Though they say, oh, it's the Virgin Mary. Nowhere in the Bible are we told, told to burn incense to the Virgin Mary, but it happens every day. Uh, in, in, in the paganized form of Christian worship that we know as the Roman Catholic Church system. And so, now, Isaiah, another great prophet from the Old Testament, is going to weigh in on this whole mystery of Babylon thing. In verse uh, 1 through 15 of Isaiah 47, Steve. In other words, these were apostate Jews doing this. Apostate Jews. Just like today, we got apostate Christians yeah. doing the same thing. God has been merciful and patient. If I was God, I, you know, I, Ken Holman <laughs> said, Ken Holman said, he read the verse where it says, you know, the God, you know, he sendeth the lightning. He sure. says, man, a lot of folk here on the planet are lucky I can't send it the lightning. Because if I could, I'd send it first to Hollywood, destroy the entertainment industry, and then I'd send it to the Catholic churches all around for the perversions and the abomination. Then I get the TVN and the prosperity gospel ministers like T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen and all those guys. I'd be sending it a lot of lightnings <laughs> to a bunch of different places if I was the king of the world. I'm not, so my job is just to preach the gospel. Yeah. Vengeance is mine. I will pay them back, say the Lord. Just do what I told you. Pass out the tracks and tell people about Jesus and leave the lightnings to me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to do. But the lightnings are coming. Yeah. And God's going to be sending it them not too long from now. So, uh, verse uh, uh, chapter 47 of Isaiah, verses 1 to 15.
Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt, thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind mill. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted my inheritance, and given them into the hand, into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient, as thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter, the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thy heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall, I shall not sit as a widow. Now there's a key phrase. Who's that widow talking about? The mm -hmm. Mason talking about the Queen of Babylon, you know, the mourn for the Hiram Abyss, the, the, you know, the, the widow's son, you know. So, yeah, that's powerful stuff. Old Testament prophet. Steve, go ahead. And none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day. The loss of children and widowhood. Mm -hmm. They shall come upon thee in their perfection of the multitude of thy sorceries mm -hmm. and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Talking about Babylon, mystery Babylon, the woman, Samirmus. She, she's the mother of many harlot children and she's a witch. Mm -hmm. And the judgment that God's going to deliver is being told about to Isaiah the prophet. Now remember, this is 600 years before the birth of Christ about 2,700 years before Enrico Fermi and the other guys discovered the atom uh, could be split and created the atom bomb. So who were the guys? The Manhattan Project, you know, uh, Fermi, Oppenheimer, and those those fellows, you know, and they, they read that passage from, I forgot, it's like, I am become death, the destroyer of the world. Um, and, and that's that's what uh, I think discouraged, uh, you know, it was either Fermi or, or Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. I think, uh, that said, I want to get out of this. I've unleashed a, a monster that can destroy the world. This was written, what Steve is writing, reading to us now, the prophecy given to Isaiah was given 600 years before Jesus, 2,700 years before the atomic bomb was created. Wow. But I digress. Continue, Steve. Verse 10. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it rises, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitudes of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so, be thou shalt be able to profit. If so, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsel. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from the things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored. Even thy merchants from thy youth, they shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. I think that what Isaiah is being told, what Steve just read, is that the headquarters for the mystery of Babylon religion, originally in Rome, mm -hmm. but possibly relocated in Iraq, is being targeted here, God is going to allow it to be destroyed by thermonuclear warfare. The fire that's described here 
could only be produced by a thermonuclear warhead, which hadn't been created, you know, wouldn't be created for another 3,000 years before this thing was written. So fire comes down and consumes the entire city. Whether it's the Vatican in Rome, or the Vatican in Rome is relocated to the plain of Shinar in Iraq, which is what I think is going to happen. After the thermonuclear fire wipes out all life there, nothing there but the owls and the monsters and the satyrs, which aren't fully human and are apparently able to live in the radioactive waste fallout of the nuclear warfare that destroys Mystery Babylon in one hour. Boom, it's all over. And that's the judgment I believe that God's going to send on this Mystery Babylon system. It's not going to be by piecemeal. It's not going to be over time and through preaching the gospel and slowly but surely we, we you know, uh, chip away at Mystery Babylon. God's going to put it in the heart of the Antichrist and his governors to unleash nuclear warfare on this seat that has just been built in the plain of Shinar for the Mystery Babylon Goddess Worship System. Where you read that? In right. chapter 17, where he talks about uncovering her nakedness, right. Unco setting her on the pull up your thigh, and expose your thigh. And then 17 is the exact same thing. It's the same thing, isn't it? 17 in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 47 and Revelation 17, you know, uses the depiction of a woman who's a harlot, who's got her fancy clothes on. Now God is ripping her clothes off and exposing her shame to the whole world. Now the Mystery Babylon Harlot System no more. See, he's going to put in the heart of his governors to destroy that woman, which is a city and a system with a thermonuclear warhead, and it's going to be all be gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, let's jump back into the uh, book of Revelation, uh, chapter 18. Let's read uh, verses 19, 9 through 19, if you were to be. 18 and 19? Uh, 9 oh, through 19. 19. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of, the, of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manners, manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and cinnamon, cinnamon and other odors and ornaments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and bees and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruit of that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and good and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for her fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in thy fine and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the companies of ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried then and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying, what city is like unto the great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that uh, had ships in the sea by, the, by reason of her costliness, for on one, in one hour is she made desolate. 
Okay, so we find out that Babylon is destroyed, and that destruction seems to me to be a thermonuclear warhead, or several thermonuclear warheads. And we see that Babylon is described as having merchandise sold and bought different things. And, you know, it, it's interesting, verse 13, in a long list of things that were bought and sold in Babylon, the one that jumps out to me is verse 13. It says, and cinnamon is what she was buying and selling, right. and odors, mm -hmm. and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men. She's trading in souls. Eternal life is being lost. This is the false Christianity system that Dave Hunt says, you buy a ticket to heaven and wind you up in hell. She's trading in exchange for wealth, the souls of men, Satan. Continue to make me rich and prosperous, Satan. You know, God of this world, I can give all the kingdom to whoever I choose, Satan said to Jesus, and Jesus said, you're right, for now. And she strikes a deal with Satan, you continue to give me wealth and riches, and I'll give you the souls of men. And eventually God has enough of it, and he sends the thermonuclear warfare, or maybe God sends supernatural holy fire down like he did in the Old Testament, and destroys it himself. But I think he's going to put it in the heart of the Antichrist and his governors, to shoot one of those nukes off and wipe out the city of Babylon. And it's because, you know, it says the captains who did trade with her stand afar off and see the smoke for torment rising. That's why a lot of people think that because of verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto the great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by the reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. That's why some people think New York City is the city that is described as Babylon, because when the World Trade Center was destroyed, you could see off from New York Harbor and from the Hudson River and from the East River the smoke of the two worlds. A cosmic cloud. The, smoke of the two World Trade Centers rising up from the footprint uh, of the World Trade Center in, in Manhattan and, you know, towards the southern end of the island. But I don't think so. I think it's going to, again, be the rebuilt city that's going to be um, the headquarters for the Mystery of Babylon system. Now, some people say, well, you know, the Plain of Shinar is not really a port city there. Now, there is the Euphrates River that kind of tools along there, so it may be that the Euphrates River will be like a tributary that will lead out into, you know, one of the great waterways so that trade and all that, who knows what wonders they can do. I, I remember when I went to Israel and I visited uh, Cairo, Egypt, we had to take a bus and drive from, uh, you know, Tel Aviv through the Sinai Peninsula to get into Egypt. And I remember as we're going through the desert, I see like, man, it looks like a mirage. Everywhere you see is nothing but sand, you know, the hot sun and sand. And I see this gigantic, you know, tanker ship sliding through the desert. And I'm like, what? It's like I'm not having, maybe it's the heat, I'm having sunstroke, I'm seeing, I'm hallucinating. But that looks like a gigantic, you know, like tanker ship that I would see in the Midwest, you know, pulling into ports in Detroit or uh, on the Great Lakes in Michigan where I grew up. And it was sliding through the desert. And I go, oh no, that's the, the Suez Canal has been dug into the ground. You just can't see it because of the sand dunes. But that ship is traveling through a waterway that was carved through the desert to get through from one side of the Sinai Peninsula to the other, uh, you know, attaching two great bodies. So I don't know if they're going to do something like that with the Euphrates River so that there can be uh, port uh, trade going to and from the new Babylon that's rebuilt. I've seen you know, money doing crazy things in places like Dubai and in the Middle East where oil money is rich and available, the architecture and the things they can do. I don't doubt that they can build a canal that will connect the new rebuilt city of Babylon, the plain of Shinar, with any great waterway necessary and that that prophecy can literally be fulfilled. Um, but again, I think, think it's going to be a nuclear destruction. So now, uh, Albert, if you would, uh, read for us. Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 1 through 4. 
Yeah, the Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. Good point, Steve. The, uh, is it the Indian Ocean? Uh, the Mediterranean and... The, oh, the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf, yep. Which goes into the Indian Ocean. Good point. Two great bodies of water connected by a, 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 a narrow waterway, but wide enough for the biggest tanker ships in the world to get through. Right. That's where they have a lot of crocodiles. Yep. Verses 1 through... Uh, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give them the rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how hath the oppressor ceased the golden city ceased Whatever all that means. Oh, well, I'm going to explain it to you, but the king of Babylon is none other than the Antichrist, I think, who is going to be headquartered and running the new city of Babylon. Once the Miramis is destroyed, now Satan, through the person of the Antichrist himself, can rule the whole world. And judgment is being brought down on him. Now skip ahead to verses 12 through 17 of the same chapter, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So there we have in those two passages from Isaiah 14, we see that Israel will be freely and invidiously oppressed by Satan through the person of the Antichrist. But when Babylon falls, which will become the new seat, the new headquarters for Satan and his Antichrist, once that falls, Israel will finally be free from persecution and all the prophecies relating to the awesome things God has planned for Israel will take place. And then we see in verse 12 through 17 that the real power behind the Antichrist, the real king on the throne of the world prior to Jesus' return. It's none other than Satan himself. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer, the light bearer. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He's looked at as a brilliant, glorious creature. He's the real king behind the Babylonian queen, Semiramis, the queen of heaven, who then gives place to the new king, which is the Antichrist. The Antichrist pushes the queen of heaven off the throne because Satan doesn't need her anymore. Now Satan can dwell right directly in the body of the Nephilim God-man, uh, Antichrist, who, just like Nimrod who preceded him, is part human and part demonic in a supernatural body that can do super powerful things like all the superhero movies that we're seeing on, uh, in the theaters. Uh, so God is eventually going to judge that and Mystery of Babylon will be destroyed, the Queen of Heaven will be destroyed, and now Antichrist is left. And he's sitting on the throne of the world at this point with no goddess worship system. And now we'll see that next week he's going to eventually be dealt with, but not yet. We haven't gotten to that point yet. So now let's finish up with Mystery of Babylon, verses 20 through 24. Steve, close us out on Revelation 18, and let's, let's take a look and see what happens here. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians, and of pipers and trumpeters, shall be heard no more at all in the and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard, shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. 
and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy virgins, which were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. So we see finally Mystery Babylon has killed, and remember we talked about the Roman Catholic Church, has killed far more born-again evangelical Christians than all of the Caesars combined together. Eventually, during the Mark of the Beast system, when people that refuse to take the mark because of their faith in Jesus, they're going to be exterminated wholesale. You know, and so Mystery Babylon is, is accredited as being responsible for all of that. Finally, we see in verses you know, 20 through 24, God has avenged himself against Mystery Babylon. And remember earlier on, you know, we saw that, goodness forbid, in Revelation, you know, Albert, I'm going to let you read that last portion there, that the martyred saints of the Lord were crying out like, hey, you know, we, we got killed, you know, how, how long are you going to be patient mm -hmm. with, with Satan and his horse, Babylonian whore? How long until we are avenged our debts? And we're going to find out that this is where it happens, right there in Revelation chapter 18, verse 20 to 24. Uh, Revelation 6 just reminds us, what, what did the saints of the Lord say to God, the Father, after they were killed and, and sent to the Father's house? Be martyred in verses 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, thou thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. So he's saying, how long, O God, dost thou not judge those who killed us and sent us to the Father's house by the way of the sword without our heads? And the answer is Revelation 18. You got 12 chapters to wait. <laughs> uh, and, and here it comes. And boom, it came down and judgment was made. And so now with, uh, you know, with that being read, let's take a look real quick at our multicolor chart here. And so we see the seven jewels on, on Babylon, verses Revelation chapter 17, 1 through Revelation 18 through 24, basically you have seven, and it's funny how the Bible uses supernaturally, like the symbols of seven, a series of seven, seven days in a week, you know, seven, 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years of man's rule through Satan on the earth prior to Jesus coming back. And we see seven being a big part of the Bible. So we have here, We've got seven dooms on Babylon, and we see one, the first doom, that it's devoid of human life. The city of Babylon is now devoid of human life. Two, it's burned with fire. I think it's thermonuclear warfare. The city of Babylon, which was the precursor, or the precursor of which was the ancient Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was built, will come back again in the last days, and it will be this revived Babylon, run by Satan, through the whore of Babylon and the Antichrist that gets the judgment. And three, destroyed in one hour. That didn't happen to ancient Babylon or to Neo-Babylon, but it's going to happen to the revived Babylon that is established by Samiris or the spirit of Samiris and the Antichrist. Four, people are afraid to enter into our borders. Why? Because the city has been wiped out through thermonuclear exchange and radiation has poisoned the land so that only the satyrs, the half goat, half men monsters, are dwelling there. But the Arabians don't pitch their tent there. In other words, human beings that used to live there, that's why I think it's the plain of China. They can't live there anymore because they've been incinerated. And no human being dare go in there lest the radioactive fallout kill them as well. So we find out the fifth doom is what? Riches are brought to nothing. And boys and girls, if we have learned nothing, it is that. The riches of this world cannot last. Why would you trade your soul for something as ephemeral and as useless and temporary as riches? One minute you have it, the next minute you don't. One minute you have a nice house, and then the wildfires of Southern California drives all those multimillionaire Hollywood producers out into the streets. Got nowhere to stay because your mansion burned down. And so you know, one day you could be the richest man in the world. Next day, doctors say, I'm sorry, it's uh, inoperable.
and you got mm, six weeks, and then you'll be launched out in eternity in just a few weeks. So all the riches in the world doesn't mean anything for you if you're going to die and not be here to enjoy it. So let's look at the sixth doom, the violent overthrow of the Mystery Babylon system, which once was the Tower of Babel, but now is establishing the goddess worship system where Christians are killed, children are, are abused, and Satan is worshipped in the form of the goddess system. And then finally, seven, all activity in ancient Babylon, in the Neo-Babylon, that's going to be rebuilt by the Antichrist, it's going to come to a cease in one hour. One hour. I don't know if that's a literal, maybe that's a literal reference, you know. You know, one hour, 60 minutes. You can hardly destroy a whole city in 60 minutes with, you know, uh, swords and staves and, and shields and rocks. But with a thermonuclear warhead, you drop one, one hydrogen bomb can ruin your whole day. And can ruin the whole day for everybody in the city. An entire city can be wiped out with one of the more powerful ultra-megaton thermonuclear hydrogen bombs that we have now. And so I think, again, supernaturally, the Bible told us 3,000 years before the first atomic weapon was ever created that the city of Babylon would be destroyed with a thermonuclear bomb. And that, however, that proves what? That the Bible contains the real word of God. It's not just the writings of religious men of some persuasion. Oh, you know, there were Jews or Christians, and they wrote down religious writings that they thought would be nice. No, it contains advanced knowledge of what happens 3,000 years from now. There's going to be a weapon so powerful that a whole city can disappear in less than an hour. Now, nobody knew that back in, in you know, 1,000 B.C. Nobody even could imagine that you could build a weapon so powerful that you could drop it and make a city disappear. Now, we know that we've got a bunch of those all over the country. The Russians got a bunch, too. And now it looks like, you know, North Korea, Kim Jong-un has them, too. And so, we are living in the final hours, boys and girls. And so, Mystery Babylon, the great harlot who has deceived and seduced, has finally been destroyed. Now, Antichrist is sitting on the throne, all alone, ruling in her stead, and indwelling in him, is none other than the power behind the throne, Lucifer. God in human flesh of this world. The God of this world, we learn, is Satan. And we find that he finally gets his throne. He finally gets his 42 months to rule. And then we find out that just like Samirimus and Mystery Babylon, the whore of Babylon was destroyed by the judgment of God, now Antichrist and Satan are left. The judgment of God is coming. He's taken out Mystery Babylon. Samirimus has gotten hers. And now we're going to find out next week, Antichrist and Satan, they're going to get theirs too. But not in the hand of any thermonuclear device. God himself in human flesh is going to come back to do that job. He's not going to let anybody else get the honor of taking out Antichrist and Satan. But Jesus Christ himself at the return of the king in Revelation chapter 19, which is what we'll be looking at next week. So, read up on that. Revelation 19, boy, the most exciting chapter in all the Bible and the most exciting group of words ever collected together in one place. The return of the king, Jesus Christ comes back to do battle with Satan and his Antichrist face to face, not metaphorically, not spiritually, not through prayer and fasting, not figuratively, but literally face to face in a confrontation on the plain of Jezreel in the Valley of Armageddon. And next week we'll find out who's going to win. So we'll save that until next week. And so with that, why don't we close this out in prayer there. Uh, you know, uh, Albert, you want to pray for us there? Dear Lord, thank you, Jesus, for this Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for this knowledge and wisdom which has been displayed upon us, dear Lord. Lord, uh, bring us back next week. Same place, same time, dear Lord. Let it be a fruitful week, a blessed week, dear Lord, and keep us safe. And uh, again, thank you for the word, thank you for the knowledge, and uh, and uh, this is all very thought provoking. But Lord, your word is your word is bond. You will occur, and and, and uh, again, bring us, you know, God willing, bring 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 us back next week again, dear Jesus. In your Steve, throw in a little prayer for Vaughn and, and oh, Southeast Asia and Vietnam and Ben down to Brazil.
Lord, uh, again, we have a couple of brothers who are elsewhere, certainly Vaughn out on, on assignment, uh, certainly for work, Lord, but also an opportunity for him to share the gospel in a far flown place that we would never be. Yep. Lord, I thank you for Ben and the you know, work that he has the opportunity to do down in Brazil. And Lord, I thank you for this little house church and just the, the, the wisdom that you have imparted in this young man who's leading this study tonight. Lord, from a young man, you, you raised him up and you, you showed him the word, and Lord, you helped him develop it. Send him off to law school, taught him well, and be able to bring, uh, Lord, an energetic and just informed look at your word that I think that we just don't get very many other places. Hello, thank you so much for it. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, and the infinite price that you paid for us. Lord, it's just, uh, I, 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 what else can we ask? I mean, it's, we, it's, it's beyond what any of us could pay. And Lord, we thank you again for, uh, for that debt you paid for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Steve, great yes, prayer. Sir. Shut us out.